today I'm going to be talking about something you may feel deeply uncomfortable with, and that's sharing lots more of your personal data with big business. So before you all start making your way to the exits, I'm going to be describing to you the benefits for society in general, for you personally, and specifically in terms of savings, saving you hundreds of pounds a year on your groceries, on your cleaning and household bills, thousands of pounds a year on insurances, and saving untold hidden costs for social service and healthcare providers. So to understand the potential for customer data in business, we need to start with the human heart. The human heart beats 80 times a minute, 4,800 times an hour, 115,000 times each day. And it has been our personal, unique trace signature since the dawn of time. And we're increasingly comfortable sharing that heartbeat with others. And that's not surprising. It's in our interest to understand how we're doing, what's normal, what may represent a worrying anomaly. And that data that we share is increasingly joined up. It describes our total body function rather than an individual organ, and as such is a trusted measure of our health and well-being. We probably don't think too much about how that data is being used. Now, it's not an exaggeration to say we've added a second trace signature to our lives, and that's the data we spin off as we go about our everyday business, our data heartbeat. And that heartbeat is in every way as vibrant as our human heartbeat, given that we spin off a few tens of pieces of information when we visit a coffee shop, a few hundred pieces when we visit a grocery store, a few thousand pieces when we use our mobile phones, and a few tens of thousands of pieces when we go online. All told, our data heartbeat is just as active and just as vibrant as our physical heartbeat. However, when it comes to sharing our data heartbeat, we are extremely concerned with how that data is being used. Looking at the press, it's clear our concerns are in two areas. I mean, superficially, it's about nuisance marketing. But more fundamentally, it's about how we're being interpreted, an invasion of privacy, how we're being understood, and how that data is being used by big business. And as a result, we support data privacy legislation, which is increasingly restrictive, with punitive penalties for misuse. And it's remarkable, looking around the world, how similar the data privacy statements are, always placing control in the hands of the individual on a company-by-company, event-by-event basis. I mean, on what other subject would you have such close alignment between the world's two economic superpowers? Now, there are always outliers, and for those very concerned about your data, I would steer clear of Pakistan, <laughs> but it represents the exception rather than the rule. Now, there's no doubt that data privacy is well-intentioned, but fundamentally, big business has re-engineered itself for the information age, and we are starving it of the oxygen it requires in order to make smarter decisions on our behalf. So, going back to our human heartbeat, that's like going to the doctor and saying, Doctor, I'd like you to make my life better. He says, how? And you say, I'm not going to tell you. Or actually, more specifically, you say, I'm going to tell you about one organ once, and I'm going to leave you to join up the dots. So the idea behind Love Your Data is that we need to move to a new age of open source sharing of commercial data where businesses are allowed to understand us as a complete digital human, we benefit from their more efficient use of resources, and we can still choose to opt out of those marketing messages that we don't want to receive. So let me explain this to you using two real-world case studies. The first of those is in food retailing, and the second is in motor insurance. Booz is a small family-owned retailer in the northwest of England. Historically, they knew very little about individual customer needs and behaviors. Then, in 2014, they launched this customer loyalty program, where, in return for free tea, coffee, and customer discounts, the shopper agreed to share their data. 
And the idea clearly works, since 65% of Booth's sales by value now go through the scheme. So what do Booth's do with this crucial data? Well, the first thing they do, you'll all feel very comfortable with, because they save you money on your weekly shop through their price match program. Taking internet technology and your marketing permissions, they match the prices on a basket of goods against four other leading retailers. And that five pounds a week average saving feels pretty good, doesn't it? Well, now let's talk about something they could do that's proven to be far more contentious, and that is tracing your movement through their stores using your mobile phone. Now, some of you may remember that US department store chain Nordstrom's got into a heap of trouble last year when they quietly informed their customers that they would be tracing their movement through the store using cookies on their mobile phone. Now, where Nordstrom customers saw data privacy concerns, I see a raft of eco-friendly, cost-saving opportunities. Booths could reduce heating and refrigeration costs in aisles with low customer traffic. They could reallocate staff in stores based on their busyness at certain times of day. Or, over time, they could fundamentally redesign the entire store to sell more from less space. The same data privacy concerns have been raised around personalized pricing, where each individual may pay a different price for the same item in a store. Now, the assumption has always been that data would be used to drive prices up. But 20 years of aggressive cost-cutting in food industry have seen prices fall to an all-time low. And intense competition between retailers is likely to see prices stay that way. So rather than paying the same generic price applied indiscriminately to all customers, I'd like to see us using the latest shelf-edge pricing technology to deliver personalized pricing based on our loyalty to booths, based on our pricing sensitivity to items in that particular aisle, or based on how much stock booths has sitting out back at one particular point in time. Well, now let's get really personal with data. This is a data slide from a real-life Booth's customer. This individual, over a period of less than 500 days, visited the same Booth's store 830 times. In that time, he bought 700 bottles of Coca-Cola, 350 packets of cigarettes, 450 hot meat pies, and 230 lottery tickets, maybe in the belief that life could get better after all. <laughs> now, what should Booths be doing with this data? Should they be sending him well-being messages to encourage a healthier lifestyle? <laughs> should they be sending him financial incentives to switch to lower-calorie alternatives? Or should they be fundamentally restricting his choice in certain categories? At the same time, do Booths have a responsibility to inform social service and healthcare providers? This individual is going to be a significant cost to them one day. How do they ensure that day is not today? Well, the case for open source sharing of commercial data is even more evident when we look at motor insurance. Your motor insurance journey is, is pretty simple. Today, 70% of all UK drivers input a limited set of self-reported data into a pricing aggregation site like this. And given that averaged self-reported data, a young male driver, let's call him Billy, would typically pay £2,000 a year to insure a very modest car, say a Ford Fiesta, a car that itself may have only cost him £2,000 to buy. Well, how would greater data sharing help Billy and help you. Well, in agreeing to use this aggregator, Billy has already opted into two basic data checks. The first to verify his identity, and the second to validate his self-reported no claims discount level. And those two checks alone could reduce his premium from £2,000 a year to £1,800 a year. A further check 
of his public credit score rating would take his premium down still further to £1,600. If Billy allowed his insurer to check with his roadside breakdown provider whether he has a policy in place, that's a further saving. And if Billy was, allowed, was allowing them to check that he'd had a policy in place for more than three years and had not made a claim, indicating that he's a responsible driver with a well-maintained car, that's a further saving still. But now let's look at three areas which we're currently not allowed to do, but would all save Billy significant amounts of money. And we're going to call those mobile miles, parking amnesia, and why is nobody a worse than average driver? One of the greatest challenges for insurers is that nobody really tells the truth in terms of how many miles they're driving. 50% of all UK insurance applicants claim to drive less than 8,000 miles a year. In fact, most claim to drive fewer than 5,000 miles a year. Yet we know out-of-town drivers, like Billy, who lives in a rural area, will drive on average 12,000 miles a year and often many more. Billy also seems to suffer from parking amnesia. 80% of all UK insurance applicants claim to park their car off-road, usually in a garage overnight. 80%. Yet only 35% of UK homes have a garage. <laughs> so, if we were allowed to tap into Billy's mobile phone provider, we could look at his mobile miles. That's the distance his phone or device travels by mode of transport, and that would allow us to validate his true mileage. At the same time, we could use the GPS chip in his phone to work out where his car has been parked overnight. Now let's talk about Billy's driving behavior. As I said, everybody assumes that they are a better than average driver. Well, we're able to check that using one of these, an in-car telematics device. Using this device, we can see how Billy really drives. Now, one of the sad facts is that young male drivers like Billy are the greatest cause of motor accidents on our roads. They have more accidents, and those accidents involve more bodily injury than any other age group. As a result, 65% of your total insurance premium is used to cover medical costs and personal injury claims. So, if Billy took a telematics device, we could check whether he was off-road during the accident watershed. And that accident watershed is 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. on Friday and Saturday nights. We could also check for the presence of, other dri of, of passengers in the car through a Wi-Fi chip installed in this device. And through that, Billy has the potential to make significant savings on his insurance. All told, if Billy were able to share his data freely, he could save up to 50% on his insurance costs. And you and I wouldn't have to cover the costs of his averaged self-reported data. Finally, medical service providers and emergency services could better plan their resources for people like Billy. So where's all of this taking us? Well, fundamentally, I think we need to grow up about our view with sharing data to big business. And we need to allow big business to realize its potential, move beyond the tyranny of averages, and start offering us prices based on who we really are, a complete digital human. Now, to do that, we need four steps in place. Firstly, as individuals, we all need to be willing to share our data. And we need to be willing for the companies that we share it with to share that data with other companies. And in return, what we've got to demand is, what are you doing with that information? What value am I receiving? Those companies need to demonstrate not just compliance with minimum legal requirements, but they need to demonstrate a strong competence to manage customer data in the right way. And their shareholders need to hold them to account. Thirdly, we need a data sharing environment and set of processes which bring together data from all walks of life and allow us to be viewed as the complete digital human. And finally, we need regulators to move away from inflexible data privacy statements and regulatory frameworks to embrace a world where customer data is seen as an asset 
rather than a liability. So, love your data. We've created a brilliant second heartbeat. We do need to protect it, but we also need to nurture it and watch it grow. After all, two heartbeats is better than one. Thank you for listening.